Hi, folks. Welcome to the Half King tonight. It is a pleasure to see so many of you all here. Um, we are absolutely thrilled to be welcoming Mr. Ron Caps here tonight. He has written just an incredible memoir, and I'd like to start by thanking um, Scott Manning of Scott Manning and Associates um, for bringing this one to us and the Schaffner Press for having the wisdom to publish a really wonderful and meaningful book. Um, I think a lot of you uh, know Ron, personally it looks like a good friendly audience, and, but for those of you who aren't um, as familiar with him, um, Ron, Ron's bio reads like one of the more interesting novels of all time, and we are really lucky to have it captured here in this memoir. Um, he is, has served as both a senior military, uh, military intelligence officer in the Army and an observer for the U.S. Department of State. Um, and he is um, a combat veteran of Afghanistan, um, serving in the Army and Army Reserve for 25 years, where he entered as a private and retiring as a lieutenant colonel. He also served as a political officer in the Foreign Service. As a soldier diplomat, Cap served in Rwanda, Kosovo, Afghanistan, Iraq, and the Darfur region of Sudan. He was twice awarded the Bronze Star Medal for his service in Afghanistan and received the William R. Rivkin Award from the American Foreign Service Association. His policy writing has uh, appeared almost everywhere there is to mention, and he is the founder and director of the Veterans Writing Project, a nonprofit program that provides no-cost writing seminars and workshops for veterans, service members, and their family members. He is a truly amazing fellow and a wonderful writer to boot, so we are thrilled to welcome him here to share his memoir, Seriously Not All Right, Five Wars in Ten Years. Welcome, Ron Cass. Thank you. Um, as thrilled as Clay is that you're here, I can't tell you how thrilled I am. It's really, this is the, the hard launch of the book. It's the first night, big event. Um, had some press today, and some of you I know heard that press, and thank you for coming. It really, really means a lot to me to see you here. Some of you I've known for too long to mention, and it means as much to have you here. Um, I should mention we have C-SPAN. Uh, Book TV is here, so I'm going to talk and tell stories and read for a while, and then we're going to take questions, and um, Michael and James are going to move around with the microphone, so if you have a question, just let them know. Um, this, there's two stories in this book, and if you have a chance to, if you've, if you've read it, at the very beginning I tell the story of driving off into the desert with a couple of beers in my truck and a pistol when I was getting ready to kill myself. And obviously something happened and I didn't get to do that. So that's the central point of the story. That's the point where everything changes. So the first half of the story is how I got there. And the second half of the story is what happened afterwards. And I think the second half of the story is probably, I think for most of us, the more interesting story and certainly the more hopeful story, but it doesn't make sense without telling the first half of the story. So what I will do is read a little bit from a couple of sections, um, and we'll talk afterwards. I served as a soldier for 25 years. Half of that time I was in the regular army, and half of that time I was in the army reserve. During the time I was in the Army Reserve, my civilian job, because you have a civilian job, was as a foreign service officer for the Department of State. I was a political officer and got sent to a lot of interesting places. Uh, the first half of my career, I tell people all the time, I was very dull. I didn't do anything very interesting. I never got shot at. It was just a peacetime Army job. Then I joined the Foreign Service and I started going to places where they shoot at people regularly. And things got much more interesting. So this begins in about 1996 and runs through 2006. Those are the 10 years that I was deploying. I'm going to start with a story that takes place in Kosovo, um, and it's 2008. I worked on Co in Kosovo as part of a team of American diplomatic observers. Half of our team were foreign service officers, and half were military officers. And our job was to sort of drive around the province of Kosovo and stop the fighting to get the Serbian military and the Albanian rebels to stop killing each other and killing civilians. Um, we arrived in the village of Sinek, 
a day too late. The Serbian infantry had come through the day before, and uh, this is the story of what we found. It's part of a, an essay I wrote um, that was published called Yellow, and now that essay's become a chapter in the book, so let me get started with that. Yellow. Their skin was yellow. They had dirt under their fingernails and their feet were dirty. There were six of them, all women, under the tarpaulin. Some of them had lived long enough to have their wounds bandaged before they died. Some of them were killed more or less instantly as shrapnel or 7.62 millimeter rounds had entered their bodies. They'd been dead for about 24 hours. We knew this because we had come to witness their funeral, to witness and to stand a type of guard. If we were present, the Serb snipers would not shoot at the family members as they buried their dead. It was the first time I'd ever seen war dead. I remember being surprised that their skin was yellow. My experiences with death before that had been limited to a few funerals, a friend's older brother, my grandmother. None of them were yellow. So I was surprised. This was the first time I'd ever seen what dead people looked like if no embalming was done what they looked like without makeup and a nice suit of clothes. They were just dead. Lying in a tangle of limbs under a blue UN tarp on the trailer that only a week before had carried peppers and corn to the market in Malashevo, only parts of their body were visible. I couldn't see all of their faces. One had an arm resting across her forehead. One had a bandage covering most of her head. One of the dead was missing an 18-month-old child. We'd seen some dogs on the way up the trail. Morgan Morris, the dauntless U.S. Refugee Agency field officer who'd led us to the scene, said what all of us were thinking. The dogs probably got the body. She was right, of course, but none of us wanted to be the one to say it. We'd just seen the mother resting in a house in the village a couple of kilometers away. She had a bullet in her upper arm. The bullet had passed through her baby then through her breast before lodging in her arm. The father said the baby was killed instantly. The bullet tore the child in half, he said. He had dragged the mother away to safety. A doctor from the Red Cross was treating her wounds in a small house in the village. There were 10 women and a 72-year-old man in one stifling, airless room of the house. All of them had been wounded in the attack. They sat silently on the floor, their backs against the walls of the room, lost in their pain and their thoughts, waiting. We did this pretty much every day for two years, driving around Kosovo, trying to stop fighting, almost always a driving, a day late, too late to stop the fighting, just in time to conduct an investigation of a war crime a crime against humanity, ethnic cleansing, murder. And I would write reports about what we saw. I would go back to our office in the afternoon and sit at the computer and write crisp, dry reports about messy, horrible acts of cruelty. But I knew this wasn't enough. I knew I needed to document more. I would go home then to my room or to my tent, wherever we were staying at the time, and sit down and write the rest of what had happened. And those sessions of writing grew into this book. So that what I wrote about that event in Cynic, I sat down one night and typed out the words yellow, their skin was yellow. And so that's where we are. That day we were up in a small valley, a little draw between two ridge lines. And the infantry, the Serbian infantry had swept through firing mortars directly in front of themselves to clear the path, and then coming through with infantry. What they were shooting at were women and children and old men who had been driven out of the town of Senek a couple of kilometers away by mortars just the day prior. And they had moved up into this little valley, this draw, to try and be safe. And then the Serbian infantry came through. We drove back down into the town, and this is what happened. The villagers wanted to bury their dead in plain sight of the ridge line where we could still see the snurb.